So thank you. I'm here with uh, uh, Professor John Rury, Professor of Education and History at University of Kansas, um, and a uh, prolific author, uh, many articles and books, uh, most recently the fourth edition of Education and Social Change, yes, Contours in the History of American Schooling. Um, and um, it's tremendous to have you here. Um, Great pleasure. Long time, long time noted historian. So we we talking a bit about this effort to try to convey some of the lessons, if you not lessons, but some of the what we can learn from having taken a historical perspective over years and, and looking at this. Um, and what are some kinds of, sort of headline lessons or things that you take after uh, having spent uh, some time in? trying to look at the enterprise of schooling from a historical perspective? Well, schools uh, were established for purposes uh, in the 19th century, and the school system uh, that we have today uh, sort of took shape then, and, and uh, it's, it's been operating to uh, serve civic purposes and socialization purposes and, and cognitive purposes, if you will, helping people to think about things a little more clearly. Um, and th there's been all kinds of other reforms within that to try to, within that framework, to try to get the schools to do one thing or another. And, uh, so uh, uh, what I uh, thought we could talk about today a little bit is um, uh, what we could call uh, unintended consequences or unexpected outcomes. Uh, and, and a lot of this has to do with the school system has a logic itself. I mean, that, that um, and this is sort of the neo-institutionalist perspective that we get from sociology, but uh, we can see it certainly historically also, that uh, once, the, once the institutions are established, then there's a, um, they operate in ways that uh, are um, some, and this of course is David Tyack, or Cuban's point, that, uh, that resist reforms or transform them. And uh, um, so I thought we could talk about some of those examples that, that sort of come up in my own work mm -hmm. and I think sort of uh, uh, and, and can help us think about schools and, and what they do and what the possibilities are for them mm -hmm. uh, uh, as we consider um, how we want the education system to look in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, so you mentioned the, the Cuban tech and I love that the, the wording around this grammar of, of school uh -huh. and the sort of underlying structures and logics. Um, but you, you, uh, we've talked about uh, uh, some unintended consequences of reforms that did go into play. Yeah. So uh, see, for me, I, I think that I mean, there's the institutional logic certainly, but then there's also the uh, people that the schools serve, and uh, uh, they have a big impact also. So, so one example we talked about a little while ago was, uh, and this is in my first book, which uh, education women's work, which which looked at. Uh, education for young women, uh, high school education, uh, between uh, roughly 1870 and 1930, so sort of latter part of the 19th century, early 20th century. And so one of the big developments and reform was home economics. Um, and this is a uh, period of uh, large-scale immigration, industrialization, urbanization. And one of the dynamics, or one of the, the uh, uh, ideas behind school reform at that time was tr to try to ameliorate or uh, uh, buffer the effects of those big social changes. And reformers were concerned about the the uh, the, the youth, uh, the kids who are living in these uh, very crowded city neighborhoods that uh, and their parents are working at factories or they're working at other menial jobs or living in tenements uh, and the uh, Reformers see these places as unsanitary and unsafe, and uh, that uh, the, they worry that the kids are not learning the proper uh, uh, way of life that they associate with the United States. You know, sort of the pastoral idea, you know, kind of t being in touch with nature and and uh, the and, and learning the uh, the uh, ways of behavior and, and uh, comportment associated with, with that kind of a, uh, a setting. Um, so uh, so one of the responses was home economics, right? To, to teach young women 
how to cook, how to take care of a house, how to have the proper standards of, uh, of cleanliness, and, uh, and, and, and see there's a moral dimension to this also, right? Because uh, cleanliness is goodness, right? And, uh, um, so, uh, and, and also uh, uh, the idea of beauty, right? That, uh, that make the home beautiful, even, even with, within modest means, cleanliness, and some aesthetic sensibility about, about a nice house or a nice apartment. Uh, there's a story that uh, appeared in one of these sort of reform uh, publications about the, the, the girl who in her home economics uh, class learns how to uh, arrange things in the house and, and, and tidy things and, and to remove the garbage and the dirt and to to, and, 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 and from a vendor buy a, a, fla, a rose and bring it up and put it in a, a little va, a vase on the, the windowsill. And then the, the, uh, the father who's, who's uh, gotten you know, off from his job and he's gone to the saloon and he's had some alcohol and he's coming home in the stupor and he comes into this, this, this home that's been transformed and it's 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 cleanly, it's clean, it's neat, and it, 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 there's this aesthetic dimension with it. And he realizes the error of his ways, and that he feels ashamed for, for having spent the family money and spent time in the saloon. And see, this is so. This 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 idea that the home economics and that the transformation, the consequential transformation of the home can have this beneficial moral impact on, on the immigrant family and the culture and so on. So, so there's this idea of home economics playing this kind of a uh, ref larger reform role. Now, okay, so this results in, I mean, this and a lot of, you know, sort of similar arguments uh, helps to persuade uh, school authorities in many places uh, that home economics is indeed a good um, and of course the other worry is that these young women particularly in the cities uh, they're dropping out of school because their families are struggling uh, they're in these poor circumstances and, and they're going into the labor force they're working in the garment industry they're working in as domestic servants uh, they're working in other kinds of light you know, uh, manufacturing. Um, I mean, which, which these are jobs that don't require education for the most part. So, so they worry that, and so the other thing is that this home economics is going to, they're, they're worried that these young women are, are going to grow up unprepared. They're, they're out of the home, they're not learning from the mothers, they're not going to know how to raise their own families. They may not get married. They're, they're worried about this, uh, this Women losing touch with their with their domestic roles, their natural domestic roles. So, so this is the other impulse behind economics: is to train them to be good mothers and good housekeepers. Uh, when when it doesn't appear to be uh, that doesn't appear to be happening. Okay, so so home economics is is really um, developed out of concern for this particular group of. Uh, potential students. So, now of course what happens is the home economics goes into the schools and, and many other things are going on in the schools at this time. Um, and as it turns out, uh, home economics does not, uh, I mean many young women uh, take the home economics courses because they're there and they're told to take them, but uh, they're not very popular uh, among the women in the urban context, the young women. Instead, they are going and taking the courses in typing and in stenography and in bookkeeping because that's another booming uh, market for those kind of jobs. And, and these young women are, they, those are well-paying jobs. Those are jobs in nice, clean offices, not in dirty, dangerous factories, right? The, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire occurs at this period, you know, this really terrible accident, hundreds of young it's a big national scandal. So the office is a very safe and, and appealing environment. There's also lots of eligible young 
men working in offices. So there's this, and there's these romance novels about the office romances. So so, so there's an allure, right? So so the, the in the urban context, these are the courses that are getting the, and not so much home economics. Now home economics, it turns out, is very appealing to women, young women, in rural areas, right? Because they. You know, they are sort of growing up in this ethos of, of uh, homemaking and, and, and uh, um, cooking and canning and preserving and, you know, all of these sort of domestic uh, dimensions of life in the countryside. So home economics turns out to be very popular in, in rural areas, small towns, but less so in the cities. So here's an example of reform that started off with a very clear set of objectives and hopes for social transformation, but that gets transformed itself, not by the school so much, but by the clientele, who had very different interests. So, so a legitimate set of worries, or at least legitimate in the minds of those who are having these worries, and a need for some kind of intervention. A perceived choice, need. A perceived, perceived need, yeah. perceived need. A, a choice to use the schools, which is another matter, to be a lever on that change. Yeah. Um, and yet, the, the the use by those who tended to shape uh, to shape it in different ways. They have different ideas, right? <laughs> different they, ideas than they the reformers. Do not, they don't. They don't really care what the reformers there think. We go. They're like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna use the school for these other purposes. Gotcha. Now, another instance you mentioned as well had to do with the South before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we can think of this as another case, right, with the uh, sort of the unintended consequences of school of reform. But, but uh, in the South, in the uh, post World War II period, uh, there's a series of court cases. This is pretty well known now. Um, the NAACP is undertaking these uh, uh, challenges to segregation, uh, particularly at the higher education level at first. And, uh, um, and they're successful uh, in the University of Texas, University of Oklahoma. And uh, the, uh, the, the argument is that uh, separate but equal is not equal, right? It, so you can't have a, a separate law school be the equivalent of the University of Texas law school. So you have to integrate it. So, so the, uh, the southern states uh, can uh, see where this is going. System. And, and of course, historically, the southern uh, school systems were not just segregated, but they were uh, uh, incredibly unequal. Um, I mean, African American schools were funded uh, at, at a tiny fraction of the level of the white schools, and, you know, through most of the 20th century. Uh, now that you know was was gradually changing, but uh, around 1948, uh, the southern states. Uh, began this uh, series of uh, moves with, and it was under the rubric of equalization. Now, equalization is a term that had been used for, it was an earlier battle over teacher salaries and so on, but, but it came to assume the sort of wider meaning, which was to, uh, to kind of level up, to, to, to spend more money on African American education to make it at least appear to be more equivalent to white schools because um, they were afraid that uh, the they were that they were very vulnerable to this charge of unequal treatment, which was uh, you know the Plessy uh, uh, decision back in the 1890s had had uh, you know uh, maintained that segregation was okay as long as you had equality, right? The 14th Amendment said that, that you cannot have um, Inequality due to unequal treatment, due to race, right? So, uh, so equal treatment had to be there. So the equalization campaigns was to tr was an effort to try and make this uh, at least appear to be equal. And one big piece of that, one major piece of that, was building high schools for African Americans. In 1940, uh, if you look at African American 19 year olds uh, using census data. The, high school, the number of those with a high school diploma was about 13%. And for white 19 years olds, it was almost 50%. So the African-American uh, 
rate of high school graduation was less than a third that of the whites in 1940. And that was largely due, and incidentally, of those high school graduates, the, white, the black and white high school graduates, they had equal likelihood of going to college. So the big barrier for African American students at that time was the lack of access to high schools. There were very few high schools in the South. They tended to be in the big cities. Most African American kids lived in the countryside in 1940. So the southern states, with equalization, one of the big features was building high schools for African Americans so that all of these counties, the South Carolina and Georgia, particularly across the Lower South, and, and uh, Alabama, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, the big focus was making sure that African American kids, there was a high school available. Um, massive building campaign. The other thing was school consolidation. Most of the uh, black schools that existed in the South at this time were one room schools or two room schools, one or two teacher schoolhouses. Really incredibly poor condition. So they were building bigger and, and just wooden buildings, just dilapidated wooden buildings. But, but no, many of them, no running water. You know. So building brick buildings that, that had multiple classrooms and you could have more curricular um, variety and, and, and more teachers. And so this was the big push in the later 40s and early 50s. And, and with those new systems, having the kids be able to go all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade. So this begins to happen as a consequence that that gap uh, in high school graduation closes very rapidly. And by 1960, 1960 is the point that uh, where you reach a majority of African American teenagers are in high school. That's kind of a really big point, um, and and they're graduating numbers kind of close to that. So, um, um, and close to that sort of 50% mark. And so it's really a remarkable change in a relatively short period of time in history. Now the southern states are very pleased with this because they're saying that, okay, we've, we've, we've really, and, and, and the, uh, between 1948 and 1952, there are several southern states that actually spend more money on black schooling than on white. Now, some places like Georgia, they're actually spending money in all schools, and this is how they sell it to the white voters, right? This is a school enhancement plan that's going to be for everybody. But when they do that, they're, they're trying to spend more money on uh, African-American schools. Now, this doesn't, you know, the money just goes from the state, these extra monies, because most schooling is locally funded, but this is a new thing in the South at that time. Those, those extra state monies come in, and a lot of the local school boards take some of that money and use it on the white schools when it should have been for the black schools. So, so that, I don't want to make it seem like the black schools that are being built are equal to the white schools. In some cases they were, in most cases they were not. But, in any case, the consequence is you have suddenly, in historical terms, a pretty brief period of time, you have large numbers of high school graduates who start going to college. So that, and in the South, that means segregated colleges. So they're going to um, uh, uh, North Carolina A and T, or they're going to um, uh, Tuskegee, or they're going to um, you know uh, the, the state, the, largely the state institutions are growing more rapidly at this time. And uh, now the other thing, of course, that's going on at, at the same time is the uh, Civil rights movement is gaining steam, and uh, you know one of the huge events in the history of the civil rights movement is the uh, the lunch counter sit-ins, which began in North Carolina, and it's college students, African American college students, and this was sort of a spontaneous thing, right? That going into a, what was supposed to be a segregated lunch counter and just sitting down and saying, "Look, serve us." Right? And, and, and uh, of course, the authorities don't want to make a big scene. So, and, and, and when this happens, it gets in the newspapers. 
and it just spreads across the South. And, and the group that is spearheading this are the African American college and high school students, which suddenly there's large numbers of them, which wasn't the case uh, 20 years earlier. Um, and, and then later on, there's the freedom riders, you know, getting on buses and going into the segregated bus stations and, uh, you know, going into the, the segregated bathrooms and the lunch counters again, and then, and then there's big confrontations with the police, and this is getting national attention and sort of mobilizing opinion against the, the system of segregation. And the, 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 the shock troops, the front line of this are those African-American students. You know, when Martin Luther King goes to Birmingham in 1963, and those, those uh, you know, Bull Connors got his police dogs and the fire hoses and those those are students those are high school students and college students who are in the who are, who are taking that uh, abuse and, and getting getting uh, attention internationally shining the spotlight on the vicious character of segregation in the South. Now, when the southern states in 1948, 49, and 50 decided to start pouring money into African America, did they anticipate that this was going to ha have the result of, of uh, creating a generation of activists? I'm guessing not. That that's what happened. <laughs> that's what happened. So, yeah. unintended consequence. And again, it's, it's what the schools get used for, right? Because when they built those schools, the schools weren't staffed by white teachers. They were staffed by black teachers, right? And, 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 and the other thing was going to high school at that time. You know, high school education had been denied to African Americans for so long um, that, and, and, and the idea that, that, that education was something that African Americans, A, didn't need, or B, couldn't handle, right? Or they, they you know, they lacked whatever, you know, the intellectual uh, uh, grounding or capacity or capability for that. So going to, going to high school and graduating and going to college was a, was a re refutation of that, of those ideas. So this was sort of, this was part of the movement, right? And, uh, and, and there being, you know, in those institutions there's this, there's this idea of freedom of inequality, right, is, is what they're striving for. So, so the, uh, those institutions that were built with this money, um, you know, were, were part of an ethos of resistance that, that uh, you know, it's, it's not surprising that those kids were, were responding in such large numbers to the, to the, uh, to the development of the civil rights movement. So, um, so it's the, it's, the, it's the uses that the institution is put to by the, by the people, right, yeah. that, that, yeah. That, are, that, are, that are coming to it, right, that, uh, and, and in many cases that are new to it, right? They, you know, they, the institution has a logic. It has a, it was created for certain purposes, but people come to it and they, they have different uses for it. Yeah. So, yeah. It reminds me of, the, of Morell's work on the, on the uh, some of the cities in the north looking at eastern immigrants coming in and the various Americanization programs, right? And I thought right. that was, uh, it was funny to see. I mean, how to Americanize, teach language, and teach them the rights of the American democracy, and one of which they thought was great. This is a free press, so now we can go out and found Polish-American local newspapers exactly, to advertise right, the right, glories right. of being Polish. Right, right. <laughs> and so they right. asserted their ethnic identity right. after having been prepared right. to, to do that. That's a so, good example. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, so, uh, Maybe shift a little bit, but some of the, the other work you've looked at in particular, and I was still working on, has to do with uh, looking at the, um, what the, the geography of inequalities, mm -hmm. the changes yeah. taking place, particularly across suburban and urban mm -hmm. lines. And I was wondering if you might well, there's the big how, shift. How does that help us understand what's going on in schools? Yeah, and Jeff has written about this in his work on Detroit along with many other historians. and. Uh, so uh, this is the big change. I mean, it's from that same period we were just talking about, the 1960s, and this occurred in the South and the North. And, uh, we're probably most familiar with it in the North, uh, and it's called white flight, right? African Americans leave the countryside.
uh, cotton production gets mechanized and other things happen and uh, they have you know job opportunities with industrial growth in the north and elsewhere uh, beginning in World War II but afterwards also and uh, so you have this massive movement of African Americans out of the countryside into the cities. Now at the same time and the two aren't as linked causally as many people suspect but at the same time and in post-World War II period um, you have the veterans coming back from the war and uh, the economy is, is uh, you know, there was depression before the war, but afterwards the economy is kind of growing to everybody's surprise. Some people, many people thought we would go back to depression and they were afraid of that. But the economy was growing at a pretty rapid clip and so people were getting jobs. And, and, and these veterans, they, uh, they started having kids right almost immediately upon arrival. The baby boom begins almost immediately. And uh, so the war. Yeah, <laughs> pent up demand, right? Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. and uh, the bring the war brides, you know, all that stuff. So, uh, anyway, uh, they're looking for homes, you know, and the cities are crowded. The housing stock is old, you know. The there's there's less room, and uh, so uh, and this is the automobile is uh, this very uh, convenient form of transportation, and uh, and the developers, the housing. The real estate industry they're they're building homes on the outskirts of the city and the suburbs and this had already began obviously suburbs didn't, weren't invented with the uh, this period post-war period but they expand very rapidly and new uh, advances in housing construction sort of the mass uh, production of homes prefabrication you know that that lowers costs and and massive uh, subdivision development and planned communities Levittown New York, Levittown, New Jersey, right? So this model begins to spread. And shopping centers, you know, and prior to 19, prior to World War II, you could count the shopping centers in the United States on one hand, you know, and by 1960, there's like thousands of them. So this automobile culture, and then of course the Eisenhower administration starts building the interstate system, you know, which makes this whole thing possible. So suburbanization kicks in and you get this, this, uh, now it's often framed, this is interesting, it's often framed as a movement out of the city. And it is that to some extent. But suburbanization is also people deciding, you know, as they move to a city, they, they can move to the city itself or to the suburbs, right? So um, it's people moving into the suburbs from someplace else. They're not moving out from the central city. They're moving from some small town or from some uh, rural area, and they, they decide to move to the city because of uh, opportunities there. But they and they and they look where are we going to move to? Well, let's move to the suburbs, right? So suburban growth is occurring because of uh, people's uh, because of the types of housing, the new housing, the affordability piece, the allure, which grows with time. People choose the suburbs over the cities when they move. And that, and that actually accounts for a certain type of suburb, right? Not the, not the white flight suburb or the people leaving the city because the big city because it's, it's whatever is repelling them there, particularly race. But it's, it's people who are coming from someplace else and they're deciding, okay, we, we choose the suburb. Um, and, uh, you know, so, and of course the cities, the African Americans are moving into the city and that's where you begin to get the racial tension and conflict that contributes to what eventually is called white flight. But, uh, so it's a complicated mix of things mm -hmm. that uh, leads to this, uh, contributes to this process of suburbanization. Um, now the other th dimension of this is as people are choosing places to live, they evaluate these places in a number of terms. So there are certain groups of people, uh, particularly college educated people, but the other thing that's going on, of course, is the GI Bill, right? So GIs are coming back from the war, and there's this move to um, provide them certain benefits. And one of the things that's sort of thrown in the mix is the idea of college education, and the sponsors of this uh, 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 legislation didn't think that this would be a big issue with somebody, so I'll just put it in there. And uh, turns out it was very 
popular. So you have millions of GIs who go to college, and uh, even if they didn't finish, they they uh, had some they had they gained skills that could then enable them to get white collar jobs, live in the suburbs. So so what we find is that uh, education becomes this this uh, uh, dimension of people clustering, right? Or, or, or you find that uh, uh, certain communities, particularly in the suburbs, will have this characteristic of more college-educated adults. And these tend to be slightly more what we call upscale or fashionable areas that become known for their schools, the quality of the public schools. Uh, and uh, I was mentioning uh, earlier uh, that uh, 1957, uh, Newsweek uh, and Time Magazine published this uh, article about the first uh, sort of survey of uh, school quality. It's based on the number of national merit and scholarship finalists that each high school produces. And, uh, so there's this sort of growth, and, and most of them, some of them are city high schools, but many of them are suburban high schools. And, uh, so. Uh, there, it marks sort of a point where suddenly the public is, and this is picked up in the local newspapers, and in Kansas City, which I've studied, it becomes a big deal. Um, that uh, suddenly, you know, certain, certain districts stand out as these lighthouses of quality. And it turns out that those are the districts with large numbers of highly educated parents. And later on, the sociologists, Coleman in particular, you know, point out that. Um, the primary determinant of uh, student success on, on achievement tests, like the National Merit uh, Scholarship Test, but was the parental background, right? So, so that's what's. So this clustering uh, is beginning to give this, the suburban schools a reputation for excellence. That, uh, and of course, then the African Americans are going into the inner city schools, and as you get more African Americans. In, in, in they're coming from the south, they're poorer, they have less education. So, um, and as they uh, come to schools, uh, particularly high schools, uh, whites leave. And, and so there's this period of racial transition in many inner city areas. Um, now, those schools then suddenly are perceived to be um, of lower quality uh, because the graduation rate goes down a little bit. And, and whites and the white press and even in the African American press there's this sort of idea that the, the quality of urban education is declining and it's linked to race. Uh, on the other hand, for, for African American students coming from the South, those schools are as good or better than the high schools that they came from and their graduation rates are going up. Uh, gradu uh, African American and uh, uh, attainment is still converging with whites until about 1980, at which point the black rate of graduation is about 80 percent of the white rate. So it goes from less than a third to about 80 percent. Uh, and if you control, if we do, do a statistical analysis regression where you control for the uh, poverty level and uh, family structure and um, other factors, uh, city versus suburb, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, the racial difference, purely racial, will disappear. And actually, blacks will be more likely to graduate and control for those. Can you say that again? That sounds... If you control for, control for poverty mm -hmm. and control for um, uh, geography and control for uh, family structure, you know, uh, single parent versus... So if you have African Americans who go to suburban, who live in suburban neighborhoods, who have two parents who are not in poverty are actually more likely in 1980 to graduate from high school than white kids. And the other big factor, of course, as I mentioned, was parental education. So if you have an African American family with at least one college educated parent and all those other attributes, they are more likely to graduate from high school than, than, a, than a white student with similar parents. So, so that's what I mean by the racial uh, distinction will disappear statistically, in that sense, by 1980. 1960, that's not the case, because of the, you know, it took African Americans a while to 
So how does this affect then how we think about what are the great uh, hallmarks of uh, U.S. education has been local control? Yeah. Um, and yet obviously these are, we're talking about uh, shifts uh, and migrations and, and so forth that uh, affect who's in which localities and, and also the numbers and types of these localities. Um, how do you see, how would you explain local control? Well, it's the conundrum of the desegregation movement, you know, and the, um, this was a, it was a recognition, and this revolved around a recognition in uh, the 1960s and 70s that uh, geographic separation uh, or geographic segregation was one of the underlying causes of school segregation in many uh, big urban districts in particular. So this is where the uh, practice of busing came into play, right, so to try to overcome. Now, the 1974 Milken uh, v. Bradley decision in Detroit kind of stops that at the city line, right, where the, uh, in that case, the NAACP and other plaintiffs argued that the suburbs in outside of Detroit uh, needed to be included in the desegregation plan because so many whites had left the city of Detroit that it wasn't really possible to have integrated schools throughout the city, right, as, as a consequence. And the Supreme Court ruled on a 5-4 to four decision that because the suburban districts had not actively promoted the segregation of schools within the city of Detroit, they couldn't help be held liable and therefore included in, be included in the plan. Um, and so that, that ruling had a very chilling effect on subsequent desegregation uh, uh, decisions. So, um, or plans that kind of kind of restricted them to the cities and uh, um, and left the suburbs without having to uh, concern themselves with uh, with desegregation so um, so the busing actually I mean there's a lot of evidence uh, my colleague Argan Sanchez-Sachiago has a really terrific book coming out on Cleveland that uh, demonstrates that uh, desegregation within the city was enormously effective. That it really uh, uh, improved the school experience and attainment and achievement for African American students and had little to no negative effect for whites. And it was a very carefully, thoughtfully uh, planned and uh, conducted uh, desegregation plan, um, wherein uh, um, uh, students were, were virtually randomly distributed, which really makes the, the, his job of analysis a lot easier and more mean and more powerful. So, um, and there's lots of other studies that, that, uh, that the uh, effect of desegregated schools was basically a pretty remarkable in, in uh, African American achievement, and if you look at the, uh, you know, the, at, at the National Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP, uh, which begins in 1971, um, between 1971 and 1988, and this is the period right when desegregation is sort of reaching its its uh, uh, climax, um, and so. The kids who are in school then are taking the NAEP test from the 70s to the 80s, right? Uh, the achievement gap as measured by NAEP, which is, like I said, the gold standard of assessment, it, it closes by 50% in less than a 20-year period. I mean, it's really, so we talk about the achievement gap today. Well, here's a period, well, we've talked about two things. Number one, the attainment gap, the graduation gap, dramatic closing. Right, and because of equalization and desegregation, and then the achievement gap, dramatic closing, because of desegregation. I mean, not entirely. It's complicated.
Um, and a lot of it has to do with the improved education of black parents, right? But another piece of it is the desegregation. And uh, of course, desegregation stops, like I said, slows down a lot. And then after that, we see that the gap ceases to close. So there is this broad historical uh, set of developments that kind of point to some very interesting um, uh, relationships. You've been very generous with your time, but if I can squeeze in one more question. Okay. Given all of that, how would you locate the current sort of reform agenda that particularly has an emphasis around standards as reflected in Common Core, in a, an accountability scheme, uh, and in trying to Choice options at yeah. least in some areas. How, how does that fit this? <laughs> okay, I'm going to be. I'm going to. I'm going to. Okay, so you're asking a historian to talk about current exactly. events. Okay, exactly. all right. Exactly. So, all right. So I'll go on and I'll live here. <laughs> this is. Um, I'm, I'm like a fish on dry land. There okay? we so, uh, <laughs> We'll put you back in the water shortly. Okay. Just flip for a little bit. All here. right. So uh, I, I will say something. I'll try to be dramatic. Okay. So I'll say we have we have two systems in the United States today at least, probably more than that, but this is, these are broad generalizations. But we have, and, and uh, oftentimes people will say, the American education is in crisis and we're falling behind the rest of the world and uh, we have all these problems in the schools and so on. But, uh, but out, I would say in the suburban communities, and again, this is a big generalization, they're not all the same, but in, in, as, a, you know, as a tendency, Suburban schools in the United States, by and large, are doing fine. They are doing well, many of them. You know, there was that famous, uh, at least locally in Chicago, case in the uh, 1980s or 90s, mid-90s. It's in my, my book. <laughs> um, the, uh, this is why we have books, by the way. It's our, sort of, uh, it's our hard memory. But, uh, uh, when there was a consortium of schools in, in the north shore of Chicago, right, the northern mm -hmm. suburbs of Chicago, persuaded the, the uh, Tim's people, the International right. Math Science, to give the test to their high school students. Right, right. And they scored second in the world. Right, right. So affluent high school students, they are doing fine. Just to the south of them, in the city of Chicago, very different story. Mm -hmm. So this is this is what we have today. And this, you know, in, in Kansas City where I live, in that area, you know, there's there's the Johnson County Schools, Shawnee Mission, Blue Valley, Olathe. These are world class schools. And just across the city line, it's it's a different world. Either way, to Kansas City, Kansas or Kansas City, Missouri. Poor performing schools. Uh, and up in Missouri uh, they, they lost their accreditation. They, were, they just provisionally regained it, but they're right, you know, they're still struggling. And it's not, people say, well, that's good schools and bad schools, but it's the, it's the uh, family backgrounds of the students are the primary drivers of this. The high poverty in Kansas City and the affluence and highly educated parents in Johnson County. Um, and Blue Valley School District, uh, one of their Administrators told me 75% of the kids have college educated parents. That's, that's in a country where about 25% of the population has a college degree. So this is like triple that in that district. So, and it's, so it's not as surprising that it's high. high. Whereas in Kansas City, the number is probably about 10 or 12%. So this is an enormous difference. Um, so, so that's why I say we have two systems, right? We have the suburban system, and, and, and nobody, they're not charter schools being built in these districts. Nobody in Blue Valley or Shawnee Mission or Lee Summit or even Raytown, which is a, a uh, integrated suburb now, or North Kansas City, they're not asking for charter schools. Nobody's saying we need charters. We go to Kansas City, Missouri. The district there, the, the actual public school district, is under 20,000 now. The other, you know, a bigger group of the students are in charters. Or private schools that have been, I mean, the charters are now sponsored by all kinds of groups. But uh, so that's where this, 
focal point of this of these reform measures is on that aspect of it. and this is what you see around the country you don't see the charter schools the the call for vouchers the suburbanites they don't want vouchers they want those schools to remain at least to perceive it as very good because their housing values are tied to that right? so they, they don't want anybody tinkering with their schools Right. There's no utopia. They're, they they've <laughs> arrived, right? There's no tinkering towards utopia, right? right. So they're like, don't tinker in Utopia Hills, right? Exactly. <laughs> don't don't tinker with our schools. Go tinker in the city, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know. So so that's my observation is that the geography now means that we have we have separate systems. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, I appreciate it.